Good morning and welcome to the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist Sunday Virtual Service. My name is Bill Rote, a member of the Worship Associates team here at the church. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived at this blessed place, wherever you are watching, you are welcome here. Today, I'm at Memorial Rock. O life that maketh all things new, the moving earth, our thoughts within, our pilgrim feet, what will I do? In gladness hither turn again. From hand to hand the greeting flows, from eye to eye the signals run, from heart to heart the rival Seekers of the light are one, one in the freedom of the true, one in the joy of past untried, one in the soul's perennial youth, one in the larger thought of God, the free step, the fuller breath, the wide horizons grand sense of life that knows no death, the life that maketh all things new. Our call to worship this morning is entitled, Cherish Your Doubts by Robert T. Weston. Cherish Your Doubts for doubt is the attendant of truth. Doubt is the key to the door of knowledge. It is the servant of discovery. A belief which may not be questioned binds us to error, for there is incompleteness and imperfection in every belief. Doubt is the touchstone of truth. It is an acid which eats away the false. Let no one fear truth that doubt may consume it, for doubt is a testing of belief. The truth stands boldly and unafraid. It is not shaken by the testing. For truth, if it be truth, arises from each testing stronger and more secure. Those that would silence doubt are filled with fear and their houses are built on shifting sand. But those who fear not doubt and know its use are founded on rock. They shall walk in the light of growing knowledge. The work of their hands shall endure. Therefore, let us not fear doubt, but let us rejoice in its help. It is to the wise as a staff to the blind. Doubt is the attendant of truth. Come, let us worship together. Please join me in reading the words for the lighting of the chalice of our heritage. For holy days on which we recall the old stories, we light the flame. For Passover, which reminds us of the courage and strength of those seeking freedom in the past, we light the flame. For Easter, which reminds us that love is our greatest challenge, we light the flame. For gathering today in this sacred space, we light the flame. For the opportunity to be together as a community, to remember the past, to plan for our future, to be alive in our present.
Our reading today comes from the Gospel of John, John 20, 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hands and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe.
Before I start my sermon this morning, I want to acknowledge the new art that is hanging in our sanctuary. Six pieces by Stevie Parks, and you can see four of them behind me. Stevie is a member of our congregation, and you'll soon be able to find out more about these pieces on the art page of the church website. the importance of being Thomas, a sermon for Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021. And no, the sermon title has nothing to do with my name, I promise. 
when I shared with Marian Hirsch, our Director of Religious Education, that I had decided to preach on Easter about the story of the doubting Thomas, Marian exclaimed, oh, I love that story. Thomas is the most Unitarian Universalist of the disciples, such a scientist. On Easter, I like to explore the stories that are found in the Gospels. I like to visit them and delve into them. The Easter stories are stories of trauma and triumph. They're stories of horror and hope. And mostly they are human stories, full of all the love and grief and uncertainty and community that are at the heart of the human experience. In my sermon this morning, we're going to explore, in particular, one passage that I don't think I've ever preached about, the story of Thomas, the doubting disciple, as he's commonly called. And I want to tell this story, which Bill read from earlier, I want to tell this story in a couple of different ways. First, I want to tell it contextually, placing it among the various resurrection stories found in the Gospels. And then I want to tell it historically critically. And in the second way, I want to say a little bit about what scholarship of the New Testament has to say about this story. And thirdly, finally, I want to speak about it spiritually, about the meaning that can be drawn from this story. All four of the canonical Gospels, which is to say the four Gospels that are included in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and yes, there are other Gospels that are not included, all four of the canonical Gospels include the story of Jesus' crucifixion, his execution at the hands of the Roman authorities. Following Jesus' death in all four Gospels, he is taken down from the, from the cross, laid in the tomb, and then, following the Sabbath, all four Gospels include women who were among Jesus' followers going to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body for burial, an act of love, devotion, grieving, and care. All four Gospels include the discovery of Jesus' body missing from the tomb, as well as a visit from a mysterious stranger and all four Gospels include the resurrected Jesus reappearing to his disciples and followers, just in different ways. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus appears first to the two Marys, and then again to the eleven disciples on a mountain in Galilee. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus appears first to Mary Magdalene, then to two disciples who were walking along a roadside, and then to the eleven disciples at their dinner table. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appears as a stranger to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then to all of the disciples. Jesus even eats a piece of fish in their presence. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus appears first to Mary Magdalene and then to all of the disciples minus Thomas in their house, then to all of the disciples, including Thomas, wherein we find the interaction with the doubting Thomas, which we'll return to momentarily. And then finally, Jesus reappears to a group of the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. Taken as a whole, these resurrection encounters are intimate and tender. Jesus spends time with his followers, visiting, comforting. Jesus lingers in their presence. He breaks bread with them, shares meals, and shares touch. And Jesus instructs and encourages and advises. The Easter miracle, I think, is in part that a small, intimate community 
that had lost its beloved leader under the most terrifying and violent of circumstances. A community that faces mortal danger because of their connection with someone who has been declared an enemy of the Roman Empire. Who feel such a sense of love, dedication, and presence. Who feel that spirit of their teacher still with them. The Easter miracle is that these people, disappointed, hurt, find the strength and courage to persist as a community. I think it would have been completely understandable for Jesus' followers to accept defeat, to give up, to abandon the movement and community they were a part of, but they don't do that. They endure, they persevere. Their faith continues to compel them forward. And so in all of these stories from the Gospels, the story of Thomas that Bill read, Thomas the doubting disciple stands out. We might ask, what is going on with this passage? The story of the doubting Thomas appears in only the Gospel of John. Jesus appears to all of the disciples except Thomas, because Thomas is off somewhere else doing something else. And when he returns, the others all share with him what they experienced. But Thomas is not convinced. He says, I'm not going to believe it until I see it with my own eyes. And more than that, I'm not going to believe it until I can touch the wounds of the resurrected Jesus with my own two hands. A week passes, and then Jesus returns, and Thomas places his own hands in the wounds. And according to the text, at that point, he believes so what's the meaning of this passage? To understand its meaning, we should probably know a couple of things about Gospels. Gospels are a form of literature that we don't really recognize today. They aren't meant to be understood as histories. They're not documentaries, but neither are they fiction. The word gospel means literally good telling or good news. And what that means is that the gospels are presented as stories for making particular meaning out of the events of Jesus's life. They are about meaning more than literal truth. The gospel of John was written down, we think, sometime between the year 90 and the year 100 of the Common Era, about 60 to 70 years or two generations after Jesus was crucified. The Gospel of John was not written by John the Baptist, and the Gospel of John was not written by the disciple named John either. The Gospel was written by someone who never actually met Jesus, who pulled together stories and teachings with the goal of making sense out of Jesus's life. About a decade and a half ago, leading religious scholar Elaine Pagels offered a new and mind-blowing reading of the Gospel of John that sent shockwaves through the fields of religious scholarship. Elaine Pagels argued that the Gospel of John was written with the goal of discrediting and attacking another group of early Christians who we know as the Gnostics, who subscribed to the thinking put forward in a text called the Gospel of Thomas, a gospel which was later deemed heretical and banned by the church. Pagel points out that in the Gospel of John, the disciple named Thomas is treated as clueless. He doesn't understand Jesus' teachings during the Last Supper. 
He's absent, excluded from the group when Jesus returns. He stubbornly refuses to believe what the other disciples reveal to him, and he is ultimately proven wrong and admonished by Jesus himself. Listen to what Elaine Pagels says about John and Thomas. Quote, what you're seeing when you read these two texts together is an intense, contentious, I guess you could call it a conversation, but really it's more like an argument between different groups of followers of Jesus. What they're arguing about is the question, who is Jesus and what is the good news about him? Elaine Pagels continues, certain passages of the Gospel of Thomas suggest that all humans have within themselves the source of their own salvation. In the Gospel of Thomas, the good news is not just about Jesus. The good news is also about you and me. We were brought forth from the same source. Like Thomas, whose name means twin, we are all the twin of Jesus on a deep level. In contrast, continues Pagels, the well-known Gospel of John stresses Jesus' unique divinity. Like Thomas, John speaks of Jesus as the light of the world, but the bad news for John is that you and I are not. We have no access to God apart from Jesus. And as if to underscore these differences, John alone among the evangelists paints Thomas as an ignorant, unauthorized, faithless disciple." End quote. So let's be clear on what Elaine Pagels is arguing here. She says that the story of the doubting Thomas is included in the scripture as a way to make a pointed insult a rebuke, a biblical diss track against a theological idea about Jesus that the author of John thinks is wrong. Does anyone else find that interesting? I know I do. And it begs the question, what meaning might we take from this story then? Do we regard Thomas as someone to be pitied? Do we shake our head and roll our eyes? John maybe thinks that we should? Or do we regard Thomas as heroic? Do we applaud this disciple for standing by his convictions, for following his conscience? Do we celebrate his honesty? Do we treasure his doubts? And following the scholarship of Elaine Pagels, if we understand the figure of Thomas not as deficient in faith, but as representing a different way of making meaning, an expansive way of making meaning, then shouldn't we celebrate him for the diversity of thought he represents? Unitarian Universalism, at its best, at its strongest, includes a diversity of theologies, diversity of spiritual paths. Some of us don't believe in God, some of us do. And those of us who do, and of those of us who do, those beliefs are myriad and creative. Some of us celebrate Jesus as a teacher. Some of us celebrate Jesus as an activist and a revolutionary. Some of us, like Thomas, celebrate Jesus as the light of God, filled with the same divine light that all of us are filled with. And some of us, like John, find in Jesus, God's unique light. And some of us just aren't sure, and some of us find our deepest meaning in other stories entirely. And all of that is good. It's often been said that Easter is a hard holiday for Unitarian Universalists. I don't think that's true. It's only a hard holiday if we think the orthodox interpretation of the story is the only one that matters. And if we think of heresy as a lack of faith and doubt as a deficiency. 
But in my reading of this text, and in my reading of the context, and in my faith, I'm not convinced this is the case. In the end, after all, isn't Thomas included? He isn't included because he thinks correctly. John gets that wrong. He is included because he is needed. Jesus, I have to imagine, winks at him. Says to him, there is an importance in being Thomas. And so in our heterodox community of faith, the community church, we might remember these lessons. We might remember them as we strive, each of us, to make sense of life and love and loss and uncertainty. We might remember these lessons as we strive to heal the pain that comes from systemic oppression and the cruel crush of power. We might remember these lessons as we find joy and courage and strength from one another as well as from that source of all. And we might remember these lessons as we treasure one another, as we treasure each other in our finding of meaning and our search for truth. Amen. Each week, we hold in our service a time for sharing the joys and the sorrows that we bring with us into this church community. This past week, a couple members of our church reached out to me, asking me to place stones for their sorrows as well as their joys. The first stone that we place is placed for Bronwyn Blass. Bronwyn writes, I'd like to submit a sorrow on behalf of myself, my parents, Cam and Jeff Blass, who are also members of the church, and on behalf of the rest of our family. Bronwyn writes, my uncle, Steve Major, who was my mom's youngest brother, died last week after an eight-month battle with stage four metastatic melanoma. He was an avid sailor, a music lover, a wonderful brother and uncle, as well as a great uncle to my children, Reese and Tegan, 
end as evidenced by the number of friends who reached out to make contact during his final weeks, an excellent model of what it means to be a friend. Bronwyn writes, we are all grateful for the lifetime of memories we have with him, and we're glad that he is no longer suffering, but also incredibly sad that he is gone. We hold the memory of Steve Measure, his sister Cam, brother-in-law Jeff, his niece Bronwyn, and his grandniece and grandnephew, Reese and Tegan, in our hearts. Next stone is placed for Mary Beth Powell and Bill Rote. Mary Beth and Bill have a great joy to share. Mary Beth's daughter, Alyssa Esquivel, her husband Angel and their two children made it safely to Okinawa, Japan, where they will be living for the next three years. Bill and Mary Beth are relieved and will start planning a trek to Japan when it's safe to do so. A final stone is placed this morning for all those joys and sorrows that we hold in our hearts that were not spoken. This Easter Sunday, I'd like to share with you a prayer for Easter Day and Other Times by Vivian Pomeroy. I invite you to pray with me. O oh God, we thank thee for the stir of the spirit within us, for the courage which is equal to every new day, for the hopes which rise out of the failures of yesterday, for the resolve which lifts its head above wrong and woe and affirms its rights to repent and begin again, for the life which cannot be beholden to death, for the healing which comes to wounded hearts through time, for the sunrise which is greater than our fires and our ashes, for the joy which breaks in we, we know not how and when least expected, for the disappointment which releases bitter desire, for the darkness where roots grow, for the golden thread of valor and goodwill never lost through all the strange wanderings of humankind, for all the labors of those who have sown that others may reap, for the high calls to duty in our day and time, for the goodness which is at the heart of the world, for the spirit of Jesus, for all the saints, for all we love, and for the longing of this, our prayer. Amen. And blessed be.
I invite you to join with me in the words by which we extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Now, won't you please join with me in singing Shalom. Shalom.